Good morning, FCC. How are we doing today? We're doing good. All right, would you stand with us? And before we start, I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to come into your house this morning with other believers and worship you. Father, I just pray that you get all the glory and the praise this morning. Father, I pray that your spirit moves through the lyrics of the songs and through all aspects of our worship service with communion offering, speaking through Ryan. Father, we just want you to be glorified this morning. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. see my victory when all I see is a mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against. Bye. 
walls that we called sin and shame. Well, they were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. And he came, and he died, and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Well, this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away, and faith so weak that we could barely pray, but he heard every word, every wish. Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never once did he fail And he never will This is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sins? Nobody but Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sins? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. This is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King
May be seated. Good morning, everyone. It's Amy, and I have your morning announcements. Do you hear that? Listen closely. That is the sound of sirens. We are still on summer vacation around here, but soon enough, we will be filled with love, laughter, and little ones. Our Bright Beginnings Preschool opens back up on Monday, August the 28th. If you know anyone who still needs a spot, we do have a couple available. They can contact the church office and ask for me. Women's Ministry will be meeting on Saturday, August the 19th, up at 121 Coffee Run for coffees and calendars. Come and join the fun. If you have a child in our children's program here at church, Michaela will be holding some informational meetings on August the 20th and the 21st at 6.30 p.m. in the auditorium. Please make it a point to come to one of those meetings to learn about the amazing things that are happening here at the church. Just a reminder, Reimagine is our adult Bible study class that is meeting for the month of August at 9 o'clock. Come on out and join us. We are so excited. Are you ready? Wednesday night programming starts again on August 30th, but the meals don't start until September the 6th. See you there. All right, everyone, save the date. Our block party is September the 10th, right after church. We'll have lots of fun things to do here at the church all day. Check your bulletin for more details. See you there. Well, that was a lot of announcements, and there's way more information in your bulletin. So please check it and let us know if you have any questions. Have a great week, everyone. Goodbye. Uh, so we're going to do something a little different today. And when, when I say that, usually people get a pit in the stomach, like we're changing uh, something. I don't know. I don't like it. And it's okay because we're not going to do it every Sunday. All right. Um, but uh, in conversations I've had with Ryan before, we wanted to really make sure that um, when we talk about offering, that we are doing a, a good job as well as not just checking boxes, right? And then, okay, well, let's just, well, we got to do that at the end of service, make sure we announce it. And, um, and so this morning, 
I really wanted to take time um, to see what the scriptures say about offering and why we actually do it. Um, it's not because we're just up here asking for money, um, but man, the, the different ministries that happen throughout the week and the people that we help in this community uh, makes a huge difference, and it's all because of, of giving. Um, we also know that you know everything that we have is from God, right? And, and so just to give a little back to him, but he also doesn't want that just to be something that we do because we're supposed to do it. He wants us to do it because we give from a cheerful heart um, and because he's blessed us. Now we want to bless others. And so on the screen here in just a second is going to be um, some scriptures. But I do want to talk about our offering. So as you leave the auditorium this morning at the end of service, don't do it now. Ryan will get really mad. <laughs> as, you, as you leave the auditorium at the end of service, our offering boxes are up front in the back. If you're watching online, you can give at FCCMakewood.org or you can text give to number on the screen. Now there'll be some scriptures up that you will read on your own, and uh, after the scriptures are done, then I will pray over our, our offering. Father God, we just, uh, this morning, we focus on giving back to you what's rightfully yours. And Father, we're so thankful to be blessed enough that we can give generously. And Father, not just because we're supposed to, but because those ministries that are affected by that can get others in our community and our surrounding communities to know you. Father, what a, just a blessing it is to work at a church that already is just so generous with money and time and volunteering. Now, Father, give us joyful hearts to give. Help us find other ways to give as we continue to focus on you throughout our entire life, our daily lives. Father, may our life and everything that we do be a complete offering to you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. yourself to take communion.
Father God, we come before you at this moment of communion, remembering Christ's sacrifice for us. Father, may we never forget the power of the cross. May we never forget what Jesus had to endure to save us. There is no greater love than that to give up his life for us. Father, just knowing what he had to go through and knowing that it was just moments away and that any second he could have said no, and he didn't. Father, may we remember the power, the power of that moment of the cross. May we use that to grow in our relationship with you and to grow our faith. Father, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. First Corinthians says, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And church together will take the bread. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and drink this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And together, church, we'll take the juice. In keeping with our time of worship um, this morning, if you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, you can sit. If you want to sing, sing. If you want to pray, pray. Um, but we're going to do a couple more songs here. And I just want you to get in a heart of worship. Because knowing what Christ has done for us, the only thing that we could ever do that he wants from us is our obedience and our worship and our love for him and our gratitude for him.
take all eternity just like Lazarus oh you brought me back to life oh you brought me back to life oh you brought me back to life you brought so grateful for you. Father, that when there's nothing else in our life that we can just throw up our hands and we can just praise you. We can praise you for who you are. We can praise you for what you've done. You can, we can praise you for the promises that you've kept. That you love us and that you will always be with us to the end of the age. And all that we can give back to you then is a worshipful heart. All that we can give back to you is our obedience. All that we give back to you is our gratitude. Amen.
continuing uh, to go to make our way through core 52 this year 52 weeks in God's word together and if you haven't been keeping up or you got off track a little bit we're in chapter 32 this week if you ever get off and you're just curious or wonder if you go to our website uh, on the front page of our website and scroll down a little bit it'll tell you what week we're on um, so you can always kind of pick back up if you if you got off a little bit. But this is like chapter 32, I think, and we're talking about uh, incarnation today. We're going to be in John's gospel, uh, the next, uh, s- this next series called Eagle's Eye. And I kind of wanted to explain why Eagle's Eye. John's gospel is a little bit different from the other three. The other three gospels are often called the synoptic gospels, and they're written more like uh, biographies of Jesus and his life on earth and his ministry. And John's gospel is written very differently. It begins differently. And John, he has a very specific purpose in writing when he writes. He tells us toward the end of his gospel, he said, I I write this so that you would believe, so that you would faith in Jesus. That's why I write this. And so it's kind of choppy. It's a little bit out of order. Uh, It's not chronological, but John's trying to make some very specific points. And so if you have a Bible and you'd open it up to John chapter 1, the the idea of eagle's eye is this idea that, uh, have you ever heard someone say, man, you can't see the forest from the trees? You ever heard that saying before? And do you you know what it means? Do you know where it came from? Here's the origin of of that saying, or, or it's said to be anyway, that there were a group of blind men who were told of an animal that they were unfamiliar with. The animal was actually an elephant. And the elephant was coming to town. None of them were aware of what an elephant looked like. They were, they were blind. They had no idea of what an elephant looked like, what its figure, what its form was. And 
And so out of interest, they said, can we inspect it to know it by touch? Because we're capable of that. And so uh, what happened is they, they, uh, they, they began to, they, they, they approached the elephant, they began to touch different parts of it. And the first blind man, and he had the trunk. And so as, he, as he's touching this elephant to, to see what he says, it's sort of like a, an elephant's like a thick snake, he said. Another blind man, he had his hand on the ear of the elephant. And as he felt the ear, they say, well, he, it's so, an elephant's sort of like a fan. The third blind man, he, he had its leg, and he expressed that the elephant is similar to a tree trunk in shape and form. And then the, the last blind man, he had its tusk, and he, he was describing it as being firm, smooth, almost like a blade, he said. Like, they're totally different, right? And the, seeing the forest from the trees sometimes is being able to see the whole picture, and know what you're looking at. Sometimes to get the eagle's eye. To get above and to see all of the forest. Because when you're in it, sometimes all you see is the trees. It's kind of what John's trying to do with the life of Christ. He's trying to go, let me help you see the forest from the trees. And so when he starts his gospel, he starts it so differently uh, from every other gospel. Look at it, John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, who faithed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of, of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. This is our core 52 verse this week, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is one of the, I, 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 I can't do it justice in reading it, but this is one of the most magnificent passages of Scripture that exists. It's one of the most magnificent words ever written. Its spiritual depth and its elegance are unrivaled by anything else we could read. Its substance and its style are filled with like majestic beauty. Uh, John, he wrote this in a poetic form that uh, sadly I don't think our English language does any justice to. Many scholars in the early church believe that these 14 verses were sang as a hymn by God's people. William Barclay, these are some, some famous theologians and writers today. William Barclay, he says that the first chapter of the fourth gospel is one of the greatest adventures of religious thought ever achieved. The early church father, Chrysostom, he, he reported to have said, it is beyond the power of man to speak as John does in this prologue. Like, men aren't even capable of this. Roger Fredrickson says, This prologue is like standing in the foothills of an awesome mountain range, catching a breathtaking glimpse of massive snowscape peaks reaching up through the haze. John starts off, and, and he's just boldly proclaiming, boldly declaring that Jesus is the Word. The word is logos. Jesus is the logos, he says. And we don't realize how bold of a claim that is if we don't have some background and understand when John says that he is the logos of God, big deal. 
That is a big, big deal. It, when it comes to, to translating this Greek word, logos, translators run into this like monumental challenge, actually, because uh, you, you, you could fill a book with getting at expressing the weight of this word to the people who first read it, first heard it. A dictionary definition is that logos is intelligent or reasoned speech. Intelligent, well thought out, wise words. It's the articulate communication of intelligence or reason. It's an orderly linking and knitting together of the thoughts and ideas of the mind. Like, this is how we try to define it. It's our best attempt. It's the meaning is far deeper than when we say word. When we just say in the beginning was the word and Jesus is the word and the whole world was created by the word. Like, it just doesn't get it. There, there were other words John could have used in the Greek even that meant word. There's this word lalia, which is it, it's an unintelligent sound. It's a noise. It's an utterance. If you're trying to think of what this first one lalia means, just think blah, blah, blah. Like that's lalia. It's just words. There's another word, laleo. Laleo, it meant to speak without necessarily saying anything intelligent. And that word might uh, apply to me. (laughs) Maybe uh, sometimes. There's the third word then, rhema. Rhema, it it refers to the spoken word or the written word. It, it, It was just ordinary human language. But logos means so much more. There's the Jewish concept. Yeah, this would help us understand a little bit if we understand how the Jewish people viewed this word. The Jewish concept of logos, uh, of the word that, that he uses, that John uses, it, to the Old Testament Jew, the logos of God meant God in action. God in action. God's word, it was seen as powerful and effective. In in fact, the Hebrew word that is translated as word refers to an action or an event rather than just an idea or a concept. It's something that, it was like, uh, like a happening, an event. To say something that, uh, that something was God's word was to say that it was as good as done. He said, if you said, if you were Hebrew and you were to say that something was God's word, it just meant that it happened. It's done. The word of God was a co- equivalent to the work of God. And so the Jews understood Logos to be God's work from creation to revelation to deliverance to judgment. All of these things that God did were his word, what he had done. The origin and the the course of the entire creation is directed by God's powerful word, by his logos. So a a couple of examples in Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all, all their hosts. For he spoke, and it came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. See what we're getting at here? Logos to the the Hebrew people. In Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11, it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose. And she'll succeed in the thing for which I sent it. See, God's word, his logos, always has a deep meaning, deep purpose. It's accomplishing something. It's doing something. God's word is his work being done. Now, all all of these Old Testament passages were written in Hebrew, but in Jesus' day... The most widely spoken language was Greek, and, and so most of the Jews, and they used a Greek Old Testament that was called the Septuagint. And the word in all of these places for word was this word, logos. Logos. 
in the New Testament, they use this word again. It's in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I'll just read it to you. Just listen. The word, the logos of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Same word, logos. The logos of God was so closely associated with God that Jewish scholars began using the term for God. They actually would just call him the logos. As invading armies relocated most of the Jews to different foreign lands and they were overtaken, they quit using their native Hebrew tongue. They began using the languages of the people surrounding them. And when this happened, they would quit using the name Yahweh and they would start using the name Logos for God himself. It's how they referred to him. They called him Logos. It's the very expression of God. God's word represents his will, his thought, his action. God's word is his point of contact with the created order. You could say that God's word is a bridge between him and us. So when John's Jewish readers hear him say that Jesus is the logos of God, can you think of what an outstanding What an astounding claim that was to them. And then there's the Greek concept of logos, see, the the Gentile uh, concept. See, they, they held that the logos was the mind of God. Greeks, they viewed logos as an expression of God, but their idea of God was quite different from the Jews. The, the, the Greek concept of logos began with the philosopher Heraclitus around 580 B.C. He was an Ephesian philosopher who who is famous for the illustration, it is impossible to step twice into the same river. Deep stuff. He taught that the the cosmos exists in a constant state of flux, and, and so change, he said, is constant. Change is it is constant, it's always happening, it never ceases, it never stops. He taught that, that because of this, change is not random, change is not aimless chaos, change has a purpose, change has a direction, and according to Heraclitus, the, the Logos controlled and ordered the entire universe. It was what brought order and control to everything that is. After Heraclitus the, the came Stoic philosophers, and, and this is where they said that Logos is the mind of God. It's the mind of God, the principal order of the universe. It was Logos that made the universe a cosmos rather than chaos. And out of all, th- all the things that John could have said about Jesus then to begin his gospel, to, to encourage us to believe in him, to, to faith in him, to live our lives for him, all the things he could have started by saying, all the things he could have called him, he starts with Logos. It, it, he, he's saying Jesus is God in action. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is God, he is the fulfillment of God's will. He is here by the purpose and the promise of God. He holds the creation together. He he gives direction to the entire universe. He's the mind of God that brings order out of chaos. John's saying Jesus is the perfect expression and representation of God. If you want want to know what God is like, John's saying, look at this man, look at Jesus. When the beginning happened, he was already there. He wasn't just with God. He was God. He took part in creation. He helped make all things. And he's the light that gave birth to the universe and to life as we know it. He says, and this word was made flesh. Those are bodacious claims on all accounts. 
he's, he's claiming that Jesus is equal with God, but John is just getting started. He's about to make the, maybe the most audacious claim that he makes. He helped speak the cosmos into existence, and now he's entered into his own creation and become part of it. John writes in verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was actually coming into the world. That should blow our minds. It it gets even weirder. Jesus didn't enter creation as the most brilliant star in space. He didn't didn't come in a powerful hurricane. He didn't stir up the ocean with a a most impressive message. He he didn't enter our world in a massive cloud formation. It's it's nothing like that. We we couldn't have missed that, that kind of message. No one would have missed that. But verse 10 says, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. How does God become part of his own creation, and we completely miss it? Well, he comes as a baby. As a tiny, insignificant human. In an insignificant village, in an insignificant country. He came as one of us. And that's what theologians call the incarnation. God became flesh. You understand how incredibly ridiculous that is? That it's the biggest point of contention, actually, between Christianity and all other faith traditions. A God that would become like his creation dwell with them? Mark Moore wrote in Core 52 this week that how can the eternal God squeeze into such a small package? For for many, it's unthinkable that God would reduce himself to a human being. How do you fit infinite wonder and glory and power into a five-pound sack of flesh and bones? It's preposterous, it makes zero sense, and yet it's the very miracle that makes our salvation possible. How do you save people? By becoming a person and solving their unconquerable problem. More, he goes on in, in this week, and I, I'd love for you to read it. it it's, it's awesome what he writes. But he says that the incarnation, it tells us three really important things about God. One is that God is near. One is that God is near. He's not distant. He's not far off. He won't put you on hold or leave you talking to an automated answering system. He's near. He's present. Incarnation is about presence. He's present with us. This is what the incarnation tells us. It literally says in the Greek that he he pitched his tent among us. When it says he made his dwelling, he pitched his tent among us. Among us, he said, this is my neighborhood, these are my people, this is where I belong. I belong with them. They belong with me. And and when you're curled up on your bed, when you're in, in, in your darkest times, or when you're crying out to heaven, the logos of God, the word made flesh, assures us that God is near to you. He's near. He's present. He cares deeply. Because the second thing he says is that God is love. He's love. The incarnation tells us that he's love. The only thing that explains why Jesus would do what he did, why he would take on human flesh, why he would enter our world, our mess. It's a mess. It's a mess. We're a mess. I'm a mess. Lisa knows. Lisa, how long have we been working together now? Long enough. You knew I was a mess before we hired you, though. Only love could do such a thing like this. Paul, Paul says in Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were a complete disaster, he stepped into our situation. It made me think of something this week. Um, Soma, uh, our, our third daughter, it, when she was growing, when she was little, um, she was growing, like, we went through this phase of time where... Um, 
she was still in diapers, but her poop didn't stay there. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I've got a picture here that would give you some idea of what was going on. See, she's in the sink in the bathroom because the, there was poop in the tub. Because <laughs> she was supposed to be in the tub. And man, we would, we would go up after nap time. This was a real thing. We would go up after nap time. Her diaper would be off. Poop would be everywhere in her crib. I mean, it just looked like, I mean, oh man, it was, it was awful. It was a disaster. It was a mess. It looked like something exploded in there sometimes. And it smelled worse. And the only thing I could think to do this is awful. If you, if you know me, you know that one of my favorite things, like, it almost is like a step as close to heaven as I get on this side of earth is a Sunday afternoon nap. Like, I love napping on Sunday afternoon. And I remember the day that I just said, we're going we're gonna to kind of handle this. And I went up and I l- laid in her bed with her for my Sunday afternoon nap. Guys, I was out. I mean, I was out, out. I mean, I had sang some songs, read a book, and I was, as, I was asleep. And in the meantime, what happened, happened. And when I woke up, it was all over her, all over me, and all over the bed. And I got up, and I was not ready to be up. And I, and I cleaned her up, and in the bathtub, I cleaned myself up. And, you know, and I remember she's fresh out of the bathtub, towel wrapped around her, put her diaper on her, and I'm sitting in her bedroom on the floor, and my head is just in my hand, and I'm just <sighs> like, I was just kind of collecting my thoughts. And she walked over to me. She grabbed my face. She said, and, and this little girl right here grabbed my face and she said, Dad, I'm sorry. It was my attempt to enter into the problem to fix it. It didn't happen again in her bed after that. Somehow in that moment and seeing my reaction, I think, I want to think, I'm going to pretend to think anyway, (laughs) that it got through to her. Jesus came to get through. He entered into your mess, and your mess is not much better than that mess. And he said, look, I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. And I'm going to make this right. And the best thing we can do is just say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The third thing he did was he suffered. He suffered. The the incarnation tells us that he can suffer. In most religions, gods are beyond human experience. So they have no, there's no, uh, they're untouched by human events, untouched by human feelings and emotions and all of these things. But he doesn't. He gets you. He's been you. He experienced life in the human flesh. He experienced all that we experience. He knows human foibles. He knows our limitations. He knows our, our emotions. He knows weakness, he knows pain, he knows loss, he knows fear, he knows tears. He became one of us so that he could suffer as one of us, so that he could pay the price for us. His suffering opened the door for us to become like him. He became like us so we could become like him. The Incarnation. It's a big deal. In spite of his best efforts, surgeon Richard Seltzer had to cut a nerve in a young woman's cheek in order to get the tumor that he was removing. And the result was that her mouth was permanently misshapen. And Dr. Seltzer was uncertain as to how her husband would respond to the change. And so what he did, he encouraged the young man to come in 
he was warm and, and caring to his wife as, as he came in, and he wanted to see him respond. And the husband came in, he was warm, he was even joking about her new look, but when he saw what happened next, Dr. Salser encouraged his, his encouragement from the situation, it, it turned into awe. The young husband bent down toward his wife, and he twisted his lips to fit her crooked mouth, and he gently kissed her. That's the incarnation. It's all about the divine word, making himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, shifting himself to look like us so that he could bend down and twist his lips and kiss our crooked faces with love and grace. Father God, I, I thank you so much for the incarnation. I thank you so much for, for Christ with us, Christ in us. God, I, I wholeheartedly believe that there was no other way. We encounter it on a daily basis. There is no other way to redeem and save this world if not what you have done in Jesus, the word. And there is such great power in incarnation and in presence, God. And I pray that we would not just, if we've never encountered it before, that it would become a part of our lives today and, and that we would. And if, if it hasn't been making a difference in the way that we live, God, I pray that it would, that we would live the incarnation this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there's a, I, I, I don't want to just leave it like that, so I'll just say this. Michael Frost, he's a, a missional thinker, and he says some interesting things about technology today. Here's what I think, something, if you want something tangible to do with this incarnation thing this week, here, here's a suggestion. Frost says that modern life is increasingly excarnate. He says it is defleshed the life that we're living. It's becoming more and more defleshed. Christianity's central teaching is this idea of incarnation, but like, the, like many, Frost says, many people don't think hard enough about whether they like the way technology is shaping them. We need to live a full embodied existence in community in, in place, if technology wrenches out, uh, us out of meaningful sense of embodiment, away from connection with neighbors, or out of place, out of even the place we live, then we lose something precious. We lose something important, he says, and, and using web-based tools is great, but so is walking in your neighborhood. So is hosting dinner parties and volunteering at community gardens and sharing a table at a soup kitchen or playing with your children or, or playing with children in your neighborhood or gardening or sports or games, etc. Can I just tell you this, church? Here's the challenge. You can't phone all those things in. But that's what we're trying to do. So the challenge is go. Go and be present this week. Don't phone this weekend. That's all we got for today. Have a great week.